state. So, so thanks to the, to the presentation uh, of this morning, the two presentations, I will uh, be very quick on uh, those uh, first slides. So this is a terrestrial detector. Uh, as I mentioned, the first goal uh, is to search for, uh, for WIMP. So essentially, we built our detector on Earth, and we search uh, for the interaction of the WIMP with the target of our detector. The detectable signal corresponds to a recoil, uh, a nuclear uh, recoil. We measure the energy, and we try to uh, extract our signal from the possible backgrounds. You have heard uh, already this morning about that, so I will be very brief on this. Once a WIMP uh, interacts uh, with the target, uh, this will give rise uh, to uh, an electronic recoil. And what it is important to, to keep in mind here is the energy region we are interested in. So we search essentially for uh, electronic recoils of the order of below 50 keV. And this can be easily inferred um, with some, uh, some making some assumption. For example, here for a WIMP mask of uh, 100 GV and the WIMP velocity, using the simple kinematic, you ended up with an energy recoil of the order of 30 keV. Um, <coughs> as it was explained already this morning, one of the main background uh, may come from the electron recoils uh, of gamma or beta particle interacting with uh, the electron of our nucleus. So before going into the, uh, into the Darwin project itself, let me first briefly uh, remind you about the state of the art of the wind landscape. You have already seen uh, this plot with different colors uh, this morning. So you have here the cross-section of the spin-independent uh, interaction as a function of the WIMP mass. The green region represents what has been excluded so far uh, with the past experiment, and the last generation experiments here are liquid seen on uh, uh, dual-phase time projection chambers, which, as uh, it was mentioned already, in the region above a 50 GV, they are uh, currently leading the field. So Darwin aim at covering the full parameter space up to the irreducible background uh, from uh, the neutrinos, so what we call the neutrino floor. This is the prediction of after uh, um, 200 ton per year exposure of, uh, of Darwin. So uh, uh, I mentioned the fact that this is a liquid scene on a dual phase time projection chamber. You have heard about uh, dark side and uh, argon dual phase time projection chambers. The working principle uh, is, uh, is pretty similar, but let me just stress why using xenon as a detector medium. You have understand this morning that the, the advantage of using argon comes from the discrimination between uh, electronic and nuclear recoils, and you have also heard that uh, there is a complementarity between uh, xenon and argon, and in fact, uh, the advantage of using xenon comes from the fact that it has an high mass number. So given that uh, the cross-section uh, is uh, a function of A square, you can see here the rate as a function of the recoil energy. In the energy region uh, below 30 keV, uh, the, the rate is uh, higher for xenon, which has a higher uh, number. It is also intrinsically pure, meaning that we, um, we do not have uh, um, radioactive isotopes except for the Krypton-85 that we know how to um, lower to level of uh, below a part per, per trillion. I will come to this point uh, later on. Um, another advantage is that uh, with uh, his uh, high density, it is possible to use the xenon as a self-shielding. It means that uh, if we uh, do our analysis uh, in a fiducial volume, we can use all the xenon, uh, sorry, which is, uh, which is around to screen against possible backgrounds. Another advantage is that uh, we, uh, we can also be sensitive to the spin-dependent interaction. Uh, you have seen so far the spin-independent one, meaning that uh, the we have no reason to think why the WIMP would prefer interacting with a proton or, an, or a neutron. So we usually search for spin-independent interaction, but it might also be the case that there is a preference for the WIMP in interacting either with uh, a proton or with a nucleon, or with a neutron, sorry. 
So the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, odd nucleon isotopes allow us also to make this kind of a spin-dependent search. Uh, I mentioned here easy purification in the sense that uh, to purify our xenon uh, in order to extract uh, all the possible background, for example, from the oxygen, um, we have uh, a purification system which does not need a very, very low temperature of the order of minus 100 degrees Celsius, which is, uh, we know how to deal with that, uh, technically speaking. The scalability is a, is a common property to all noble uh, liquid uh, uh, gases, uh, argon uh, as well. The fact that uh, if we use solid detectors, it will be more, much more difficult to scale it to larger dimension. And you have seen this morning that it, it is important to enlarge the size of our detector to increase the possibility, the probability of observing a signal. So we want compact detectors scalable to larger dimension. And in here, for example, you have a kind of history of the cross-section as a function of the time, and you can see that now, after um, around 2006, the uh, liquid seen on time projection chamber are uh, uh, really dominating this uh, field, leading the field for uh, high um, values of the, of the WIMP masses. Um, it was already explained this morning that the, the, the scintillation and the ionization signal, I will concentrate here in the liquid xenon, but this is uh, kind of similar for, uh, for the argon too. Um, Either we have an electronic recoil or a nuclear recoil, once it interacts with the target of our nuclei, it will generate two different signals. We use exactly the same jargon that has been used uh, this morning, so you will see in the following slides the S1 signal, which is the signal coming from the prompt scintillation after the de-excitation of the xenon, and the ionization signal, which is instead given by the electrons that escape the nuclei, thanks to, um, that escape the, the atoms, thanks to the uh, applied uh, um, electric field. So we will have an S1 and S2 signals. Uh, what is a difference, and I already mentioned this uh, with respect to the argon, is the fact that we don't have this, uh, the power of the pulse shape discrimination. So how we can use the S1 and S2 signals to distinguish between electronic and, ele and the nuclear recoil in case uh, <coughs> of uh, xenon. The, mm, the structure of a dual phase time projection chamber is essentially the same of what has been presented this morning for, uh, for dark side. So we have a part which is filled of uh, liquid xenon and a part which is filled with the gaseous xenon. In this part, uh, with the liquid xenon, we have a drift field applied. This is the reason why when the electrons are extracted, uh, they will drift toward uh, this gaseous phase. And here, in this part, uh, there is uh, an extraction field which is uh, higher, which uh, will allow us to extract the X2 signal. So essentially, we use the fact that uh, we have seen in the previous slide I didn't stress this point, but the S1 and S2 signal are anticorrelated. You can see this in, the, in, the, um, in this uh, figure. So there are some electrons that cannot escape, and uh, this will recombine, giving rise to an S1 signal. So it means that uh, in case we have a larger S2, we will have a smaller S1 and vice versa. And this is exactly what we use to distinguish between uh, the electronic and the nuclear recoils. Because in case of nuclear recoils, it is much harder to extract the electrons from, uh, from the atoms. So, so the S2 signal will be smaller compared to the case of electronic recoil and vice versa for the S1 signal. So essentially what we do is to use uh, this ratio between the S1 and S2 signal to distinguish between electronic and nuclear recoils. And you can see here, if you remember the plot that has been shown for the argon, we are uh, less good in uh, um, distinguishing between the background-like and signal-like uh, signals. 
but we are still capable uh, to make this uh, distinction. Of course, this has been uh, done using uh, calibration uh, data, neutrons and background-like uh, um, particles. It has been already mentioned the fact that uh, well, with the dual phase time projection chamber, we can also measure the position of our interaction. Thanks to the photomultipliers, uh, we have an X and Y position. And, um, the time between the S1 and S2 can be used to infer the Z direction. So let me put Darwin in the context of the, of the Xenon project, because uh, as you will see later, um, uh, the collaboration is made mostly of the Xenon collaboration plus additional institute. And this is also important to let you understand how it is important to enlarge the size of our detector to reach really the sensitivity uh, up to the neutrino flow. So we started with a very small uh, TPC, okay, 25 kilograms, uh, and the dimension uh, is uh, 50 centimeter high, which allows to put a limit uh, um, in terms of cross-section up to 10 to the minus 43 centimeter square. When we enlarge the size going to Xenon 100, whose total mass is now 161 kilograms uh, and the drift uh, uh, dimension is 30 centimeters, we gain two order of magnitude. We gain the other two order of magnitude with Xenon 1 ton, which is currently the, the, the world best limit for masses above 60 GV. So this is uh, the, the, the most stringent limit so far. And we are in the process of building uh, xenon and ton to gain an additional order of magnitude in sensitivity, increasing the size uh, of, uh, of the detector, as you can see here. So in this sense, Darwin is really considered the ultimate uh, uh, liquid xenon direct detection experiment, because with a total mass of 50 tons uh, uh, and the drift TPC of 2.6 meter, it is uh, designed to reach the sensitivity of 10 to the minus 49 uh, centimeter square that, as you uh, have seen before, is uh, uh, up to the neutrino floor. So it means that uh, increasing the size of the experiment, here you have uh, other um, experiment based on a uh, liquid scene on a dual phase time projection chamber like Lux and Panda X, you also decrease the background rate. So this is uh, really important for our uh, measurement and for our detection. So let me move uh, into the core of Darwin. Uh, Darwin uh, the baseline design is uh, reported here. It is something uh, you have seen that is projected to start in 2023. So this is uh, a baseline design and there are a lot of R&D ongoing on this and I will come to this point later. <coughs> So the design is such that it will be a cylinder of 2 times 6, uh, 2.6 times 2.6 um, in the dimension, diameters uh, and the height, uh, 50 tons of total uh, liquid seen on target, top and bottom arrays of photosensors. You have seen that in case uh, uh, of a dark side and but also in case of xenon, we use uh, photomultipliers. Uh, here I didn't specify which kind, which kind of, uh, 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 of arrays of photosensor we are using because uh, this is still in uh, R&D phase. The drift field design is reported here and the presence uh, of uh, the water shield and neutron, and neutron veto are important to screen uh, from possible backgrounds. So let me move to those uh, backgrounds, the dominance backgrounds. So we have muons that are coming from the atmosphere and thanks to the fact that we usually build our detector underground, we are screened by those muons. Depending on the, on the, uh, on the depth uh, of uh, our um, laboratory, we can be screened, uh, as you can see here in the muon flux, as a function of, of the depth. Most probably Darwin will be placed uh, uh, at LNGS so we in a profundity or in a depth of a three kilometer water equivalent that allow already to screen uh, of a factor six uh, the atmospheric uh, muons. 
Then uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, we search for nuclear recoils. There are, of course, also backgrounds that are, that are uh, simulating our, our signals. And those are the main sources of background. The high energy neutrinos, what we, uh, we just saw, the coherent neutrino nucleus scattering, which represent the background, uh, the irreducible background. We have also muons uh, that, that can interact with, uh, with the material of the detector, giving rise to muon-induced neutrons. So we will have uh, a neutron nuclear uh, recoil. And finally, there are also neutrons from a spontaneous fission from, uh, from the material that might uh, arrive up to the TPC. So we want to screen uh, all, uh, all of this. The electronic recoils uh, I mentioned that are coming from gamma and uh, beta particles, mainly solar neutrinos, but also natural uh, gamma backgrounds. And there are also intrinsic sources of background within uh, the, the TPC that are coming from the xenon itself. So essentially here you see, can see the projections uh, using Monte Carlo that has been made in 2050 uh, for the different contribution uh, that the, the main contribution come from the solar neutrinos uh, and under some assumption on the concentration of the other sources, you can see here that the, the second um, uh, most dominant one is the Krypton 85. But this was done in 2015. Now with Xenon 1 ton, we already proved that uh, the, the, um, the column uh, de dedicated to this, uh, um, to, the, to, to polish from, uh, from the Krypton 85 is capable to reach a lower concentration that was, was expected before. So essentially we will, be, we will have uh, an electronic recoil from Krypton which that is quite negligible. And uh, we will be dominated by these uh, solar neutrino backgrounds. So in, the, in general, if you put all the background sources together, you see here that the main contributions comes uh, here from the neutrino uh, solar, from the solar neutrinos and all the other components in terms of uh, electronic recoil are quite negligible, but uh, uh, the, the very uh, difficulty is uh, to remove the uh, nuclear recoils, which really looks like uh, the signal. So I put here all, uh, all the list of possible backgrounds, but you have to think that once uh, we have this uh, detector, we, ca we can also explore this uh, background as a possible signal for other uh, kind of uh, uh, searches. So the neutrinos uh, themselves, they are very interesting in their own for searching uh, specific, uh, specific channels. So Darwin uh, can be seen uh, more uh, um, as, a, as a very large uh, detector with a wide program and physics reach. And you have here a list, I will not go into the details of all of these possibilities, but you can see that the WIMPs represent just a tiny fraction of all the possible physics uh, searches uh, that we can uh, do with Darwin. So I will, uh, I will mention some of them, and let me stress that, uh, again, uh, the WIMPs, uh, um, we expect to give rise to a nuclear recoils, but there are uh, other possible channels which uh, are uh, whose signal is represented by an electronic recoil. So I will go through some of these uh, briefly. Well, the WIMP sensitivity, the WIMP search is the fundamental one, is the primary goal. You have already seen that, so I will not uh, go into the details, but under some assumption, you see once again that we are reaching, we, we aim at reaching the neutrino floor. Uh, I mentioned the spin-dependent uh, sensitivity. So essentially here you compare the cross-section as a function of the WIMP mass with the projection by the LHC using uh, uh, dark matter model, uh, a simplified model with the fer Dirac fermion interacting uh, via axial vector uh, uh, coupling. So you have for different coupling the projection here 
and you can see that Darwin will be capable to cover another part of the, this parameter space. In this sense, we say that it is uh, complementary. In case of discovery, discovery, how good we will be in uh, measuring the properties of those winds. And you see here um, an analysis uh, always done uh, through Monte Carlo where this line uh, represents always, uh, uh, the, the black line is always the neutrino floor. So imagine that you, mm, this has been done, for example, for a cross section reported here. Uh, imagine that we find the WIMP uh, um, with the low uh, mass, here is uh, the, the hypothesis 20, we will be capable to constrain it, the mass and the cross section itself. But as we go larger, higher and higher in masses, this uh, flat WIMP spectra will prevent us to make a very precise measurement. So Darwin uh, is uh, mostly sensitive in this uh, region of uh, uh, WIMP masses in case of a spectroscopy. And what is also interesting is that uh, there is a target complementarity, meaning that if we combine the data from, uh, from uh, Darwin or from Xenon experiment with other target experiment uh, like germanium or argon, we can uh, increase much more our uh, spectroscopy capability. So in uh, here, for example, you have in red uh, xenon only measurement. If we combine it with, uh, with the germanium, you see that uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is becoming a smaller, um, a smaller ellipse. I mentioned the fact that there are plenty of other possible channels that it's worth to investigate with Darwin, and one of particular interest uh, is the neutrinoless double beta decay. So why is that? Because uh, this will allow to test the nature of the neutrino, if neutrinos are Majorana or Dirac particles. Because this uh, um, double beta decay, the normal one, considering neutrino and antineutrino as two different species, has been already measured. But imagine that we uh, are capable to measure this other process. It means that, that the neutrino and the antineutrino are the same, uh, uh, the same particle. So essentially, they will annihilate each other. And the final state of this process will be represented only by just two uh, electrons. So this is a sketch uh, of a uh, possible distribution of, uh, of the energy. In this case uh, here, the two neutrino double beta decay, you will have a continuous spectrum of, of this sort, while in this other case, the, we will have just uh, two neutrinos in the final state, so we will expect a Dirac peak corresponding to the uh, Q values uh, of the of the decay isotope that we are studying. In our case, it's xenon 137. The fact that this is a Gaussian is just because uh, there is a resolution uh, of our detector which would prevent us to have uh, a full uh, Dirac peak. So essentially, uh, with the studying uh, mm, the, um, the capability of Darwin, to measure this uh, particular process, we ended up with a preliminary sensitivity, which is uh, also very interesting because it's comparable with the dedicated experiment. What does it mean? It means that uh, Darwin, it, as, I as I said before, it is uh, designed for measuring WIMPs. But the fact that uh, it contains a uh, quantity of xenon 137, precisely 8.9% of the natural xenon is made of uh, xenon 137, means that uh, the over the, the 50 ton or 40 ton of active volume, we will have uh, 3.5 tons of active xenon 137 that can be used for uh, searching neutrino less double beta decay. So under some assumptions that are reported here, we made a study to estimate uh, the, the, um, the dominant backgrounds uh, and the final sensitivity to this search. And this is the result that you can compare, for example, with the prediction of a future dedicated experiment, which is an exo, which um, if you read the paper of an exo, they claim to be capable to reach 
the the time uh, the half lifetime uh, of this uh, um, of this process um, above uh, 10 to the 28 years uh, in uh, 20 ton per year so, so we are quite competitive uh, with uh, the current present uh, uh, experiment dedicated to this uh, search there are other possible physics uh, that we can uh, search for physics process. For example, we can test the energy production mechanism in the sun via measuring the low energy solar neutrinos. Um, here you have always uh, the, the, um, the prediction made with uh, Monte Carlos. You have the rate here as a function of the energy and depending on the energy range, you can see that either the proton-proton neutrinos or the neutrinos coming from the beryllium-7. Um, <coughs> we, uh, we have uh, here the, um, the number of, of expected events, which is telling us that we will be sensitive to this, uh, uh, to this uh, physics search. And in particular, it's uh, interesting this plot where you have uh, the electron neutrino survival probability as a function of the neutrino energy. The, the measurement in blue are the, the measurement of Borexino, and this is the prediction of Darwin compared to the, uh, to, to the um, theoretical prediction. So it means that uh, we will have in a statistic to lower the uncertainty of our measurement meaning that the, any deviation uh, of this uh, measurement from, uh, the, um, from the, the theoretical prediction will indicate new physics. The coherent neutrino nuclear scattering, once more, is uh, the dominant background in this, uh, uh, in this part of the parameter space. Here in the low energy, in the low wimp mass region, uh, uh, the, the, the neutrinos are, are solar neutrinos coming from the bottom eight, while the high energy region will be dominated by the atmospheric neutrinos. But once again, this is not just a background process for the wimp, it is interesting in its own because it is a standard model process. Uh, standard model process so we, we know very well how it should uh, look like and any deviation of a possible um, distribution or the rate uh, as a function of the energy here will indicate new physics you can see for example here there is a zoom in the energy low energy region and you see that the, the distributions uh, of the neutrinos, for example, here you have the, the neutrino from the sun split it in different contribution, is very similar to the, to the WIMP prediction. So it's really hard to disentangle them with, uh, with um, an experiment of this sort. But again, any deviation will indicate new physics. Um, in terms of physics uh, uh, processes, I will, uh, uh, I will mention uh, as a last one the supernovae neutrinos, which is also another nuclear recoil process, which will uh, allow us to put some, uh, well, to, to know better the mechanism of the supernova uh, themselves, but also to know how the, uh, to, to have a better information on the, uh, on the neutrinos themselves because this process is sensitive to all six ne neutrino species. You have here the detection significance as a function of the supernova distance. Of course, uh, this is uh, once again a study done uh, using Monte Carlo under some, uh, some assumption. In this case, uh, you assume a, cer a certain value of the mass of the supernova progenitor and you make uh, the, the estimation of the significance and you see here, for example, that with Darwin we should be capable to reach a five sigma significance for a supernova burst uh, uh, far up to 65, it's here, up to 65 kiloparsecs from, uh, from Earth. Um, now I will move uh, concretely to the current status of the Darwin project uh, after this uh, overview of uh, the possible physics uh, channel. Uh, let me move on the collaboration themselves. 
uh, itself. So I mentioned already that most of the groups uh, are the same as the Xenon collaboration, but there are other groups. It's really uh, increasing the size of this, uh, uh, of this collaboration for a total of 29 groups uh, from 12 countries. Um, currently, two, two ARC grants have been founded for R&D, and I will come to this point later, and there is an internal organization in working packages mainly for perspective studies, some of them I presented to you uh, before, and for R&D activities. The R&D activities cover a variety of uh, different aspects uh, that goes from the detector design to the photodetector technology, the demonstrators, uh, the cryogenics. Uh, so, of course, I will uh, briefly mention some of them, not all of them. You have seen this picture before, so you know now that we have uh, photomultipliers arrays and that there is a study ongoing uh, to use uh, some uh, alternative uh, um, photomultipliers, uh, like uh, we have heard this morning also for the argon, we are considering silicon PM um, to replace uh, the, the, the PMT. Um, the fact that uh, the, the size uh, is uh, this huge, 2.6 meters uh, times uh, 2.6 meters, is the first time that uh, we aim at realizing such a big detector also poses some challenges in terms of high voltage proportional scintillation. And the content of the, of the, the xenon itself, you have to think that the xenon is quite expensive, so we don't want to lose uh, a grams of xenon, <laughs> so we want to improve also our storage uh, and purification system uh, to keep it purified and safe. So, for example, in terms of uh, photosensor here, you, you see a small, very small uh, TPC in Zurich, called the Xurich, uh, 3.1 centimeters times 3.1 centimeter, that is used to test the silicon PM. Uh, you have uh, here an array of 16 uh, silicon PM, and there are studies ongoing uh, to test the 3D position reconstruction and compare it with the uh, uh, the current uh, PMTs uh, in use, and also calibration measurement uh, using uh, sources at low energies that, uh, uh, that, that is exactly in the region of search uh, for uh, our WIMS. You can see here, for example, the X, uh, S, uh, X versus Y position, so how good these uh, silicon PMs are in, uh, um, in localizing uh, the, the event, and also the anti-correlation between the S1 and S2 signals using a Krypton 83M source um, for calibration. L the size of the detector, uh, once again, is uh, it's huge. So before building a detector of this uh, dimension, we want to be sure that we, uh, that, that we are capable to deal with all the different components. So the, the, this uh, uh, ERC of the University of Zurich is meant to build a demonstrator which will have the diameter of 2.6 meters and it will be uh, just uh, half a meter high in order to test, for example, the flatness of the electrodes uh, that have to be built uh, here uh, in, the, in the future experiment, and also the strength and the homogeneity of the extraction field, which is a key point uh, to, build, uh, to build a detector. So essentially, is uh, to test the component under realistic condition of the Darwin design. And similarly, we'll, there is another project uh, to test the full length uh, demonstrator, so it will be 2.6 meter high and just uh, 20 centimeter in diameter. And this is again important uh, in this case mainly to uh, prove that we can uh, correctly reconstruct the Z, the Z position, uh, imagining that in this case uh, the electron will drift such a long uh, um, distance before reaching uh, the, uh, the um, photomultipliers here. 
um, I will conclude on this uh, uh, recovery system. I said already that the xenon is quite expensive, so we don't want to lose it. Uh, and uh, currently, in a xenon one ton, uh, there is a recovery system called uh, Restock that has been uh, coupled to a second recovery system called Restock 2 for xenon and ton. The first one has a capability of se seven tons. This one has a capability of 10 tons. Now you have to think that with uh, the 50 tons of xenon, we cannot build uh, another detector just simply scaling this, uh, this up. This is 5.5 meters. So we are considering a possible modular approaches, and there is also an R&D ongoing to, um, to reach a fast recovery by gravity. Actually, we are using a setup that is made uh, for medical imaging. Um, and uh, we, uh, we are uh, testing this possibility of placing the, the restock uh, unit uh, below the cryostat, so to use gravity to recover the, the, the xenon from the cryostat in case uh, of uh, emergency. So I will uh, briefly summarize uh, here what I, uh, what I just uh, mentioned. Darwin is considered the ultimate low background astroparticle physics observatory. So it's not just for WIMP searches, but also to investigate and to probe other physics channels like reported here. But it is also very challenging in terms of R&D. So there is a, a lot of R&D ongoing and the Darwin uh, project itself is, uh, is growing a lot. So our schedule, uh, this is my last slide, is here. We are not yet uh, in these uh, engineering uh, and studies uh, and TDR, but we aim at starting the data taking here. So for the time being, we are working on this R&D and this perspective. That's all. Questions? Yes. Uh, well, just a small comment uh, and a question. No, a small comment 